and so we go um i i cook accordingly when we we do these classes it is officially 10 o'clock in the morning pacific standard time no matter where you are in jnf universe usa welcome we are so glad you are here and joining us with women for israel of los angeles host to be able to do our passover cooking i am going to take the first 27 minutes to start to review our ingredients and go over everything so if you're cooking with me you can cook with me in real time and uh, make sure you are good to go so one of my favorite things to do is to make sure everything's in place and ready to go it makes the cooking so much smoother mise en place and so we are going to start by just going through the ingredients i said already once and i'll say it again make sure your oven is preheated to 400 degrees so that when we come time to make our spiced matzo crackers we'll be ready to just pop it in the oven you don't want to make the mistake of turning on your oven and putting something in it'll burn it my daughter's done it with cookies i'm just saying okay all right so we are going to be making a uh, spiced quinoa and one of the things we're going to be doing is uh, sauteing onions so if you haven't chopped your onions do that now i already did mine i didn't want to cry in front of all of you this is a happy thing okay and by the way if you have questions as i go through the instructions or during the cooking time you can chat them and uh, Lisa Shaul will either reply back to you or she may ask me and then I can answer to everybody. But if you do have questions, be sure to use that chat box, okay? So onions, you are going to want to have diced uh, on the smaller side. We are gonna be cooking these low and slow. You're gonna wanna have a saute pan to be able to cook them down. This is the one that I'm going to be using. It's nothing fancy. It's just a nonstick pan. So make sure you have your onions cut. Uh, we are going to be, hopefully there'll be some time and we're going to toast our almonds, slivered almonds uh, for our quinoa, our spiced quinoa. And I have that cute little pan there that I'm going to be toasting them. Some people like to do it in the toaster oven. That's perfectly fine. I like it close to me because when I start talking, I lose track of things. And the next thing I know, I smell them burning in the toaster oven and that would not be good. So I keep it on the stove next to me and I can kind of keep watch. Uh, you are going to want to have your dates chopped up. So um, I had suggested Majul dates, which have a really nice caramel flavor. They look like this. Uh, make sure you take out the pit and that way you can remove it and then chop it up. And we are gonna be using, uh, let's say about six to eight dates for that. And you can chop that up. We are also gonna be doing raisins, a third of a cup of raisins. I mentioned the third of a cup almonds. You're gonna wanna have some olive oil handy and salt. And of course, for our quinoa, we are going to be making that in a pot. This is the pot that I'm going to be using. We're going to do two cups water for this. Um, so you want to get your two cups of water ready to go and one cup of quinoa. And uh, we will be making this during the class. And the star of the spiced quinoa is, of course, our shawarma spice, which is what we're going to be using today. So um, you're going to want to get out your shawarma spice. If you don't have that for some reason, it's okay. No big deal. You can add a little salt, garlic powder, a little onion powder, a little turmeric. You know, you can just wing it. Or maybe you have some other spice blend in your pantry you want to try. We'll talk more about it. Spiced matzo crackers. Uh, if you want to make this with me today to practice, I highly recommend it so you know what you're getting yourself into. I always recommend cooking things and practicing before you actually do it for whatever occasion. So if you happen to have bought matzah, we're going to go through and make the spiced matzah crackers. You might find yourself munching on them because they taste so good. So, so good. Once you add the spices to it, we're going to be using za'atar. I suggest a garlic powder, onion powder, some paprika. Um, if you have an oregano, you can use that, some salt and olive oil, and you're going to want a basting brush. Okay. And I'll just bring mine over here so you can see I have it on a baking sheet. 
it's so weird to see matzah on my everyday stuff. I keep looking at it going, this is wrong. Um, but of course, it's not Passover yet. We're just practicing. So you're going to want some parchment paper. And I'm just doing two matzah squares. You, you know, when you're ready to actually cook for Passover, you could do four of them. And that's what the recipe says. You'll want a little dish and a basting brush, olive oil. If you're just joining in now, I had mentioned earlier, you want to make sure your oven is preheating to 400 to be able to make the spiced matzo crackers. We're going to be using our oven twice, once for the spiced matzo crackers, and then again for the baked salmon, and we'll turn down the temperature for that. Um, Lisa, I'm just going to check in with you to see if there are any questions that need addressing as of yet. Um, a couple have come in, but we've nothing specific that relates okay. to the answer. Okay, great. Uh, so spice matzo crackers, we're going to talk about our spices a little later on. Uh, for our salmon, you are going to want to have your salmon in a baking dish of some kind, and I recommend getting that ready to go. This is our prep time. So this is what you should be doing now. If you're going to be cooking with me, this is what you want to have on deck is your salmon. I removed the skin from the bottom because I am baking it. Um, and sometimes I'll keep the skin on if I'm going to use it in a pan and get a really hot sear or on the grill like a cast iron pan. Uh, but because I'm just going to be baking it, I personally chose to remove the skin from it. I find sometimes it makes it a little fishy and it kind of stinks up the kitchen. That's my preference. You guys do you. Totally okay how you like to do it. If you're not sure how to remove the skin, you just want to flip it on the backside and get a sharp knife and just go really slow in removing it. And you can start to be able to peel back the skin. Okay, it takes some time. I did mine last night. I wanted to be ready for you. Okay, so Betty, I do have a few that have come in. Yeah. Um, is there a difference between powdered or granulated garlic or fresh garlic in a recipe? Awesome. So granulated garlic and garlic powder are just variations of the cut of the grain. It does not make a difference for this recipe at all. Um, I actually use some kind of um, in, in, in the same way because it's such a minuscule difference, but I'm actually using granulated. This is my granulated onion powder, which is pretty fine. And this is my granulated garlic. You, I don't know if it can come through on the camera, the differences, but the onion, granulated onion is a, just a little bit lighter and whiter and the garlic is a little more yellow. It's the same. It's just the cut of the dried garlic and dried onion. No difference there. Was there okay. another question? Yep. Does shawarma sp spice contain cayenne pepper or chili pepper? Well, some may, and I can tell you mine does not. It has white pepper and black pepper but there is no cayenne in my version, but there's lots of different spices, shawarma spices out there. So there might be others that do. I can't speak to that. Um, you know, it might have a little bit of a hot, a harif spicy flavor to it. This one doesn't. Um, it's a wonderful uh, combination of spices with cumin. The predominant flavors are cumin, coriander, turmeric, cardamom, um, white pepper, black pepper, some sumac. Okay, any other questions? Yes, how far in advance would you say it's okay to make the matzo crackers? Oh, you can make them day of and even the day before. Matzo is our crackers already. All we're doing is adding spices to it and some olive oil. So you can do a day or two beforehand, you know, not a problem. Can I use za'atar seasoning instead of shawarma? Yes, you absolutely can use the za'atar seasoning on your salmon if you would like to, no problem at all. Okay, almost done a few more. Yep, would you ever fine. use wild sockeye salmon? It looks like yours is Atlantic. Yes. Also, what does za'atar taste like? Okay, 
I'm going to hold off on the Zatar question. I promise to come back to it. I have a lot to say about Zatar, but I want to make sure we get to our prep time. Um, in terms of salmon, you could use an Atlantic salmon. You can use a sockeye salmon. Those are all fine. They're different variations. Uh, Atlantic salmon tends to be a little bit more fatty. You can see my little, you know, aminos right there, right? <laughs> uh, so it, it, either one is fine. And honestly, you could do this same recipe on a white fish also. Not everybody loves salmon. You could do it on a sea bass, on a halibut, on a mahi-mahi, all fine. Okay. Does it matter if you use toasted slivered almonds or raw almonds? Great. You uh, Slivered almonds, um, you could use slivered, you can use toasted. If they're already toasted, great. If they're raw and whole, just chop them up, totally fine. If you prefer not to toast your almonds, you don't have to. These are just my suggestions. Make it your own, do what feels right to you. Go with your flavor palettes and your style of cooking. I'm here for inspiration. That's it. Okay, real quick. Can I use less oil for the crackers and then farm salmon or wild caught? Uh, okay, so you can use less olive oil on the crackers if you want to. I mean, you're going to baste it on. So when we get to that, you'll see. We're not cooking yet, just so you know. All I'm doing is reviewing the ingredients. You don't need to do any of the cooking yet. Wait for me. I promise we'll do it together, okay? Um, we're just prepping. In terms of wild versus farm-raised, you know, there's sustainably farm-raised fish, which I am a fan of, wild-caught is always the best, but depending on where you live and what may be available to you, I'm fortunate that I live in Southern California, so I have some access to it, but you know, you go with what you can get um, and it, it's all good. Okay, carrying on. Uh, you are gonna wanna have your salmon. We, olive oil is one of my predominant um, healthy fats that I like to use, also tahini, but we're not doing that today. So you're gonna to wanna to have olive oil, shawarma spice or za'atar, whatever your preference is or anything else. Um, my shawarma spice does not have any salt in it. It's salt free. So I will probably add a little bit of salt to it. And I have some sliced lemons that I'm gonna put on top. And then you'll want a half of a lemon for after it comes out of the oven and we're gonna squeeze it on top. Okay. Uh, I have a surprise recipe for you, but I'm not telling you what it is yet. So you're gonna have to hold on. But what we are gonna do now is make, uh, prepare our haroset to get ready for it. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna backtrack for one sec, which is if you have a thermometer, we will talk, I'm sure you're gonna get a zillion questions about this, Lisa. Uh, thermometer for cooking your fish. We are gonna be cooking our fish at 350 um, and the ideal temperature is between 140 and 145. How do you know when your fish is done? You have a thermometer with a probe and you can put it in. If you don't have one of these doodads, I highly recommend immediately going on Amazon and ordering yours or wherever your local store is that you kitchen gadget store where you can find these. Life changer, get your fish not overcooked, not undercooked. If you don't have one of these today, that's okay. I didn't have one for years. And we will check our fish the old fashioned way. You can just slice it open, see if it's pink on the inside, flaky, we'll come to it. I just wanted to mention this and I will mention it again. Okay, haroset. We are making Sephardic haroset. So we are not using apples and we are not using walnuts, but we are gonna be using dates raisins, more slivered almonds or whole almonds, if that's what you happen to have in your pantry. And we are gonna be using some cinnamon, ginger, gonna give it a little bit of a kick. Um, I'm a fan of Manischewitz sweet wine for this. I don't know, there's something so Passover-y about it in creating those smells and also some honey. So what we are gonna do now is actually, uh, chop up our dates okay so we are i'm gonna do that now if you are cooking with me this is something you should do now which is you are gonna want to have a food processor okay let me just move this over 
And you want to make sure your dates are pitted. Do not put your dates in the food processor if they've got pits in them. You'll break your blade. Don't want to do that. Um, I will repeat this a little later on. I'm using the Deglet Nor dates. They came pre-pitted. I didn't have to do a thing for them versus a medjool date. These are bigger. Okay, so I'm using the smaller ones. I have about 40 here that I'm going to put into my food processor. If you're using the medjool dates, they're sweeter. You won't need as many because obviously they're bigger. Make sure you take out pits, whatever dates you are using. I am going to go ahead and put these in. And I wanted to do this now because it's going to make a loud noise. And since we are all the people that are just cooking together, I thought it'd be okay to make a loud noise. So I'm going to go ahead, put in my dates and process them. Here we go. And it's going to go slowly. Oh. Slowly, slowly, because there's all those dates. There we go. Okay, there we go. Slowly, slowly, it's going. We're going to get those all chopped up. Let's see, is the blade, uh, maybe some got underneath the blade is the problem. I think some got stuck. So I'm just going to move them. These are real life things that happen when you're cooking. Okay, brought to you by Debbie Kornberg. Okay. Debbie, is it okay to use a blender if you don't have a food processor? Absolutely. I'm going to take a couple out and try that again. So there we go. Maybe it's rejecting it because it's not my Passover food processor and it's saying I can only do this with my Passover processor. It's not meant to be done, but there we go. Okay, so we've got those all chopped up. There we go. That's the sound I was looking for. Okay, so I'm going to take these and I'm going to go ahead and put these into this bowl here, remove the blade, and then I'll throw in the rest and I'll show you what these look like in just a second. Okay, so maybe you want to do fewer at a time than I attempted. I'm going to go ahead and just pop those back in and pulse those. All right, good to go. Now we don't need the food processor for the rest of our cooking time. Our dates are ready to go. And like I said, we're going to be adding raisins, almonds, honey, and some good old manischewitz or whatever sweet wine you have. I am going to give my hands a little rinse here. And this is now prepped and ready to go. So I can set this aside and I'm just going to hold this up so you can see here what my chopped dates look like. Debbie, how many um, ounces of dates? How many? I didn't measure it that way. I counted 40 dates, <laughs> which okay. was about a cup. It was about a cup and a quarter, I believe. Hold on. Yeah, it's about a cup and a quarter. It's on the recipe sheet because I did measure it. Okay, so we're good with that. And I'm going to put my dates back over here because those are ready to go. And as I mentioned, we're going to be using ground ginger, ground like a powder and cinnamon. Okay, any other questions? Otherwise, I'm going to continue on with a couple other things. Okay, make sure your ovens are preheated to 400. That is one of the first things we're going to be doing. You're going to want to have your onions diced because we're going to be sauteing these. Those of you who cook with me, I see so many familiar faces. We're going to cook these low and slow throughout the class and we're going to add it to the quinoa at the end. You're going to want to have two cups of water in a pot ready to go uh, so that we can bring that to a boil for our quinoa. And the last thing I want to mention is we are going to be putting our salmon on a bed of arugula salad. So I have my arugula already laid out. And I also pre-cut my cucumbers and tomatoes, which is going to be the base of my salad. And what I wanted to show you was two things. One, how did I cook? 
cut my cucumbers. So I happen to have used a Persian cucumber. I sliced it in half and then I made these cute little half shapes and I cut them pretty thin. I like, I like cutting up my vegetables a little bit on the small side. And then I quartered some tomatoes here. And I did this last night and I share this with you because you see I use paper towels and I have these cute little prep containers. I like to use these uh, because it helps absorb the moisture. So the tomatoes, you know, get juicy and it can kind of make a mess and a little pool of tomato juice at the bottom. And I don't want to drown out my salad or however else I'm using them. So I like to use paper towels as a way to kind of help absorb the moisture. It works great also if you are um, like for watermelon and you want to do maybe a watermelon feta salad. You can pre-cut your watermelon, put some paper towels on the bottom. It's going to help absorb the juice so you don't have a puddle of juice at the bottom. It makes your fruits and vegetables soggy. And so in order to avoid that, I like to use the paper towels. They keep them fresh in the refrigerator and then they're just available to you. So for meal prepping purposes also. Any questions? Okay. Once you have your cucumbers and tomatoes. Debbie, actually there are, there is a question. Um, sure. Go do you have a it. suggestion to replace the almonds for those with allergies? Ah, great question. So, you know, some people are only allergic to almonds. You could do pistachios would be delicious if you can have pistachios. Um, if you can't have any nuts, maybe you can do a sunflower seed or a pumpkin seed. If you don't have any seed allergies, that would, those would be great alternatives just so you get some crunch in there. Um, so those are my recommendations. Pumpkin seeds go a long way. They're a powerhouse for protein and healthy fats also, and sesame seeds. So, okay, and then one more about the cauliflower in the notes. Um, are oh, cauliflower, thank you. Cauliflower steaks okay instead of florets? So um, thank you, whoever asked that question to remind me about the vegetarian alternative, first of all. Uh, so yes, you can do cauliflower steaks and slice it um, long and baste it with some olive oil and sprinkle on the shawarma spice or the za'atar spice, whatever it is that you're going to be using. It will cook longer. It will take longer to cook than our allotted time. So I just want you to know that. And so um, maybe... For this class, if you want to be in time with me, you might want to, because the cauliflower florets are going to take about 18 minutes and I would cook them at 425, okay, uh, in the oven and we're cooking the fish at 350, just so you know those differences. I'll repeat that again. If you're making the cauliflower florets, it's 425 for about 18 minutes. If you wanna do the steaks, I might do 375 because it's gonna take longer to cook through the thickness of the cauliflower. And um, you know, I would cook it until it's cooked through depending on how thick you're making them, you know, a half inch or an inch. So probably again, around 18 to 20, 25 minutes, maybe 25 minutes um, in the if oven. If someone is grain free, Debbie, um, is there a replacement? for quinoa? So I would say technically quinoa is a grass that's sprouted, but if you don't do that, you could do cauliflower actually um, as a cauliflower rice and you could do this. So if you want to um, have cauliflower as a rice, you're going to want to take your cauliflower, put it into a food processor um, so that it's small like grains of rice and you can put it into um, a glass Pyrex dish with about a tablespoon or two of water and cook it for 10 minutes and that will steam it. And then you can do all these other components that we're doing of adding the sauteed onions, the toasted almonds, the, ra the raisins and dates and parsley. And you could do that. So if you really just keto, what have you, uh, kind of uh, lifestyle, that is an option. Other questions? No, okay. So that's this. You can see I started uh, plating this. We can do, we'll do it together at the end also. 
Uh, so you'll want to have that ready. Okay, we have just about two minutes um, and then we're going to take a little commercial break. So I'm going to repeat some of the things I said early on in case people joined in a little later but are going to be cooking. So I'm going to say make sure your ovens are preheated at 400 for our spiced matzo crackers. You are going to want to have your onions diced a little bit on the small side. We're going to cook these low and slow in a saute pan throughout our class. And we're going to be adding this to our spiced quinoa. So um, you are going to want to have this ready to go. It's going to be one of the first things we're doing. You're going to want to have a pot that is, I like to use this size to make quinoa. You can decide um, if you want to use a bigger one, we're going to do one cup of quinoa, two cups of water. Okay, and we're going to bring that to a boil. Um, I am going to be using another pan to toast our almonds. Um, and this is what's going to be going into the spiced quinoa. Okay, any questions here? Um, yes, Debbie, can you use red onions? Oh, absolutely. Red onions are great. They're a little sweeter. They'll go beautifully with this dish. They'll pair really nicely with the shawarma. White onion, yellow onion, red, purple, all good. You okay. could even throw in garlic if you wanted to. I um, just want you to know that Lauren Lisa Bram is having computer issues, but she is with us. Okay. Thank proud you. Proud to be part of this event with her dear friend, <laughs> Debbie. Okay. So um, you may not see her. Um, can you do quinoa in a rice cooker? Can you do quinoa in a rice cooker? Yes, you can. Um, I usually use a rice cooker for rice. I tend to do quinoa on the stove. That's just my style, um, but you absolutely can. Not a problem. I'm not sure of the exact cooking time, maybe in an Instapot where you can have those different features. Um, I see um, Aggie has a question, but I'm gonna invite Aggie, type it in the chat box and then I'll be able to hear it through Lisa. Lisa is um, yeah. our conduit for questions. Is there um, a quinoa spice if you don't have the mix? Is there a quinoa spice if you don't have the mix? I will come back to that, but just pull out some spite, your favorite spices in your pantry. Okay, go with garlic powder, onion powder, maybe some turmeric, some cinnamon, some nutmeg, cardamom, coriander. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna pause here for just a second. If you have more questions, we will come back to them. Uh, we are going to take a little uh, commercial break. I will be right back with you in a few minutes. We are going to be able to open it up for everybody who's coming to join in. Uh, they may not be cooking with us, but that way we'll be able to formally start our program in just a few minutes. So I will see you soon. As <laughs> את יכולה לבחור בכל אחד אחד שיקנה לך ואחד שלא או אחד שמנגן בזמן שאת זורטת את הלב שלו את הלב שלו אז מי תרצי שאהיה אני כאן כדי לשחק למענך אביר מאיזו אגדה, לפחות לעכשיו או אחד שמחייך בזמן שתצחקי מהכאב שלו מהכאב שלו ומי שלך אז מי תרצי שאהיה אני תלוי בך, ואני גם לא, ואין כמוני מבצע כל משחק שתדרשי ממני, ממני
אז מי תרצי שאהיה? נשאר משחק אחד ואחרון שאני חייב או שאולי אני לא אחד שישאר שייך בזמן שאת בכלל כבר לא שלו כבר לא שלו ולא שלך אז מי תרצי שאהיה? מי מכיר אותך טוב יותר ממני? אני תלוי בך ואני גם לא ואין כמוני מבצע כל משחק שתדרשי ממני Well, good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to what is already a fabulous morning for cooking. My name is Sarah Cannon, and I'm a proud member of the Jewish National Fund USA, Greater Los Angeles Board of Director, the chair of LA Women for Israel, a Negev Society and Circle of Sapphire. I proudly wear this, and you can have one as well being a sapphire, and a member of both the Arts and Entertainment and Gaza Envelope Task Forces. I'm delighted to welcome you to our Women for Israel Passover Cooking Never Tasted So Good event with our friend Debbie Kornberg. Before we get started, I want to thank Dina Singer and Frances Bilak, our Sapphire Society co-chairs, Betsy Rosenthal and Maureen Shapiro, High Society co-chairs. Rachel uh, Herman, our very first JNF Future Women for Israel chair. And our fabulous JNF USA professionals, Sharon Joy and Lisa Shaul. We recommend you view the program on speaker view. Usually it will be at the top right hand corner of your screen a little symbol, and you'll notice options, gallery view or speaker view. Choose speaker view so that you can easily follow our chef and cooking demonstration. Also, you'll all be muted. If you have a question, please use the feature at the bottom of your screen and send a chat to Lisa Shaul. I know many, many of you have been doing this already. She'll be listed as the, at the top of her chat box also, we are happy to answer questions as we go along. It is now my privilege to introduce you to a woman who owns and operates her own spice company, Spice and Leaf. She has over 25 years of teaching experience and leads Spice It Up with Deb, a live cooking experience workshop. She is a regular contributor on Fox 5 San Diego Morning News and has collaborated 
with Fortune 500 companies and many meaningful organizations like our own JNF USA. She is the president of Jewish National Fund USA in San Diego and serves on the Go Northeast Task Force, which you'll hear about later. She's also the daughter of our very own JNF USA member, Marsha Ryman Sells. So please welcome my friend who inspires us all, Debbie Kornberg. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Sarah, for that lovely introduction. I love being with my JNF family. I'm always all in when it comes to JNF. And as you heard, my mom is on, so I would be remiss if I didn't say, hi, mom, so glad you're here. Thanks for helping to plan along with the amazing team in Los Angeles. Okay, we are going to be getting ready for Passover. It's next week. I can't believe it's already here, but we got to get started. So for those of you who were prepping with me beforehand, or maybe you just joined in now, make sure your oven is preheated to 400 degrees, and we are going to start with our quinoa. So we're going to take two cups of water, and we're going to go ahead and pour that into our pot and bring it to a boil. You're going to have one cup of quinoa ready to go. And there we go. We're going to bring this to a boil. While that is going, we are going to do a couple other things. Uh, when you prep in advance, you can multitask with your cooking because everything is super organized. And that is exactly what we are going to do. Uh, for those of you who were with me in the prepping, we uh, have our onions already pre-cut. We are gonna cook these low and slow in a saute pan. So that is the next thing we are going to be doing. So go ahead, turn on your saute pan and get that up to like a medium, medium high temperature just to get it heated. And we are gonna be adding a couple tablespoons of olive oil. I am bringing a taste of Israel into my kitchen. I'm using Israeli olive oil, spice and leaf galili. It comes from Beit Lechem Haglili, which is uh, the Bethlehem of the North. It's about 20 minutes from Nazareth and uh, about an hour from Haifa, just to kind of put things into perspective. So I'm gonna go ahead and add a couple tablespoons here. You can do two tablespoons if you wanna be exact. And by the way, if you have never tasted your olive oil, you absolutely should, you should smell it. Are there any aromas that come from it? It's one of the ways you can tell the quality of your olive oil. If it doesn't have any flavor and it doesn't have any taste, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But you want some of this good stuff to be able to use with your cooking. It helps elevate the flavor when you add it to salads or fruit salads, believe it or not, it really enhances the flavor. So smell yours. This one I can tell you is the Barnea. Um, and it has grassy notes to it when you smell it. And when you taste it, it has a smooth flavor. It's got like a peppery bite taste that's pungent at the end. So sometimes it has tomato notes to it. Just like wine, there's different varieties of olives. Um, there are different varieties of grapes. There are different varieties of olives. And so when you taste it, you'll get those flavors. Okay, my oil is heated up. I am going to go ahead and add my onion that's been cut up right in here. And we are going to cook this low and slow. We're going to cook these down. We might be able to get a little bit of a caramelization with our time together. And uh, make sure you have a little wooden spoon to be able to mix, mix it up a little. And once you start to hear that sizzle, you can uh, do that. So you want to have your stove on a medium low heat to cook your onions, okay? And oh, as you see, you're gonna, yeah, but I can't get those. Wait. Well, I just ended here. Hang on one sec. I okay. There we go. Um, so while you're cooking your onions, you're gonna start to see them get glossy. They'll get translucent, and then they will start to brown. And that's what we're going for. But the best way to do it is to cook it at a slow temperature. Okay, so as you hear that sizzle, you can turn it down to a medium low temperature and just let them go. So just to repeat everything that I've done so far, 
I have my oven on 400 degrees. I added two cups of water to bring to a boil here. So that way we can uh, start to cook our quinoa. And I am sauteing my onions. Lisa, before I go on, are there any questions happening right now? No questions. Okay, awesome. So that means everybody's with me, I'm thrilled. Okay, so while that's going, you wanna make sure you have your one cup of quinoa ready to go. So in talking about quinoa, it is a sprouted grass. It's a complete protein. Thinking about Passover for vegetarians, this is a great dish to be able to have as a side dish or as a main dish. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about how you can zhuzh it up as a main dish for vegetarians. You know, people's homes this year for Passover are gonna be all kinds of hybrids of Zoom and people in the house, but it's just things to keep in your back pocket whenever, if you have vegetarians in your family, one of the things I like to do is make zucchini boats actually. So you can take a zucchini, cut it lengthwise, scoop out the middle, and the filling that we're gonna be making together, you can put inside the zucchini boat with some tomato sauce in the oven, and then you've got a main dish for vegetarians or for anybody, honestly. Um, but that way you don't have to be cooking so many different things for when you're having people over, because of course you're gonna have your chicken and your brisket and those sorts of things. And this can work both ways as a side dish or as a main. Take a peek at your onions, give them a little stir. We are going to be adding um, some shawarma spice to our water. So if you don't have shawarma spice in your pantry, that's okay. Find some spices that work for you. It can be turmeric, cumin, coriander, some sumac, maybe some cardamom. If you have cinnamon or nutmeg, cloves, allspice, all of that'll work, okay? This is just the spice that I've chosen. And what I wanna share with you is that we're gonna be using it as a broth base. We're gonna be using it to add the flavor to the quinoa. And I'll tell you a secret, I'm not a huge fan of quinoa. So I am always trying to mask up that flavor. So what we are gonna be doing is creating a broth. When we think about a vegetable broth, or a chicken broth or a beef broth, all it is is the, the vegetable or the protein that's been sitting in the water and the flavor's been extracted out. We're doing the same thing with spices. Okay, my water is boiling. I hope yours is too. We are gonna add two teaspoons of our shawarma spice right in here. And you can give that a little mix so that way it's all incorporated. You're, if you're using shawarma spice, it should, or even anything with turmeric, it should look a little yellow and it will transform the quinoa to a really pretty yellow color also. Go ahead and add your quinoa, mix it in, make sure it's all covered with the water. Don't forget to put the lid back on. And we are gonna cook this for 15 minutes. I'm gonna set my Alexa timer and you're welcome if I set yours off also. Alexa, set timer for 15 minutes. There. You are going to make sure your quinoa is on a low simmer temperature, okay? We're cooking it just like you would rice, so a low simmer temperature for 15 minutes. And then when it's done, we're gonna turn off the stove, but leave the quinoa on the burner that it was cooking on for an additional 12. Okay, so we're gonna let it cook for 15 now, once on a simmer. Once that's done, we'll turn off the stove and let that go for an additional. Okay, so we're gonna put that on a simmer. My onions are cooking really nicely just to do a little close up here so you can see they're starting to get that glossy look, a little bit translucent. And uh, that's what we're going for. So those are cooking beautifully. Okay, so I'm going to move this out of the way because we're done with that. And uh, what I want to do right now is we're going to toast our almonds. This is also going to go in the quinoa. I'm using a dry pan. 
nothing in here. I don't want to add any oil to this. Let's see if this clicker is going to cooperate. It does. Sometimes my igniter gets a little finicky. So Debbie, I have my Debbie. Yeah. We use kosher for Passover couscous instead of quinoa. Oh, I have never used kosher for Passover couscous. So I, what is it? I, I don't know what it's made from. Uh, so you have to <clears throat> text back and find out what the ingredients are, but I would imagine you can. Okay. Why not? It would work fine. Just follow the instructions um, that are on there and then you can add all the components. And I would say, make sure you add some shawarma spice or something to it to give it a little bit of flavor because I don't know what the main ingredient is. If it's a potato or something, I'm trying to think what else it could be. It's probably a potato something. All right. The stove is on a medium temperature and I'm going to go ahead and add my third cup of, or I think this is a quarter cup of almonds. And we're going to just let those toast for a few minutes. And while those are toasting, I wanted to just take a moment to talk about what we just did with our quinoa, which is we added the flavor to the water, right? I mentioned that you can do it with, that's how we make tea or that's how you make soup. So you can do this with a whole host of flavors. One of my favorite spices to use is something called Ras Al Khanut, which is a Moroccan spice blend. And it's got those really warm cinnamon notes to it nutmeg, mace, cloves, allspice. Some versions have a little bit of um, lavender in it, or it might have Moroccan rosebuds. Ras Al Khanud is known as the crown jewel spice, so it's got a lot of different spices in it. But the idea is that you can use a blend, you could use an Indian curry and add flavor to your grain, or if you're doing a cauliflower rice, as we talked about earlier, right? If you wanna go completely grain grass free, um, you could do cauliflower, you could do a Ethiopian Berbere spice blend, you could use a Yemenite Hawaiian for soup blend, right? So there's lots of different flavor combinations. And as you start to travel outside of the United States, you will see that there are all kinds of flavors that people use for their go-to cooking. Here in the United States, we don't have our go-to spice. Maybe pumpkin spice blend in the fall, but that's about it. And we use that predominantly for baking. Well, guess what? You could use it for cooking too, okay? We just often think of it as a baking. Okay, any questions, Lisa? Yeah, I got a few here. Okay, um, keep an eye on your almonds. I'm just telling people to keep an eye on their almonds. Go for it. Um, yes, where are we? I'm listening. Okay, there's a question about sauteing with olive oil. Do you use olive oil for cooking at high temperatures? Do you feel there's any downside to using olive oil at higher temperatures? Great question. So um, you absolutely can cook olive oil at high temperatures. The downside is you lose the nutrients out of the oil, the antioxidants. But you absolutely can. If you were to ask um, Iran Galili, he would say you absolutely could make your lodkas, just to give you a sense of what high temperature he's talking about in there, or your sufganiyot. Absolutely can. Okay. I am, just one sec, I'm going to remove my almonds from the stove, make sure you take them out of your pan. The pan is hot. They're gonna to continue to toast and cook if you leave them in there. But you can see I've got some nice toastiness going there. So that is good. Okay, hit me with your next question. Yeah, is this the recipe you can use za'atar in place of the shawarma spice? I, I you could, I haven't used za'atar in couscous or quinoa or something like that. I was going to say you can use the za'atar for the salmon, which I have tried and is quite good. Okay, great. A question from Lauren Leeserbrand. Do we have to rinse the quinoa before? Great question. Uh, so some people do like to rinse the quinoa. You don't have to, but you can if you want to. I didn't, right? We didn't do that in our prep. You can if you want to. Okay. Dealer's choice. Okay, we got to make some matzah crackers. Uh, so, because we're going to get these in the oven. 
So you are going to have your matzah. I'm only doing two. It isn't Passover yet. Normally I would do a whole bunch if I was hosting, but it's just going to be three of us in the house this year. COVID. We will talk more about that in a second. Going to take some olive oil and a basting brush, and I'm just going to coat this. So what I love about spices is you can really take anything and add flavor. And the olive oil is just going to moisten up the cracker. It's going to give it this really yummy flavor to the matzah, which, you know, let's face it, can be kind of boring. <laughs> we are going to make sure your oven is preheated to 400 degrees. That's what this is for. We're going to be cooking it for five minutes in the oven. And if you, um, a word about za'atar, because that's what we're going to put on here, but I do want to say something about that, uh, which is za'atar is made up of three predominant ingredients. Sumac, which is a berry that's been crushed up. Hyssop, which is a native plant to Israel in the whole region. It's often referred to as the za'atar plant. And you can see here, it's this very light green. It's part of the mint and the oregano family. So oftentimes here in the United States, you might see oregano as a replacement. And also sesame seeds. And sesame seeds are kidney oat, which is um, an ingredient that traditionally Ashkenazi Jews don't eat, but Sephardic Jews do eat. So I want to put that out there so that everybody knows. That's why I did the shawarma spice for the salmon. And why in the ingredients that I give you, I also suggest that you can add garlic powder, paprika, onion powder, and oregano. So if you don't want to use kidney oat, the sesame seeds that are in the za'atar blend, you can just use these ingredients, or even you could use the shawarma spice too. It would be delicious. And I would throw in a little extra paprika and garlic powder. Um, or you can do all of it, or you can experiment and see what you like. And Daddy, our I got house... two questions about the matzah. Um, one, yeah. can you use gluten-free matzah? Mm -hmm. And two, can you use nid? Nagila seeds for the matzah crackers. Nigella seeds, nigella seeds. Okay. Uh, and so, how about yeah. everything but the bagel seasoning on the matzah? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so again, everything but the bagel seasoning also has sesame seeds in it. So that is kidney oat, technically speaking. Um, let me address gluten-free matzah. Mm -hmm. it, um, you could do it. I don't think there's any problem with it. I do find it... it Gluten-free matzah is made from potato starch. It tastes like a potato chip, which I love. I have no problems with that. So you're spicing up your you know, gluten-free matzah, no problem. Um, let's talk nigella seeds. I didn't take them out, but that's a great idea. I'm sprinkling on some paprika right now for those who are watching me. Um, nigella seeds are an ancient seed that date back to the time of King Tut. Oh, my cameraman is so on it. Um, these are nigella seeds, and I will pour some into a little dish. Hang on. I thought I had one here. Let me grab it. Oh, there it is. Just so you can see, they look like sesame seeds, but they're not. They're kind of triangle shaped. Um, and they have a really earthy, oniony, pungent-y, kind of like cumin kind of flavor. Sometimes they're referred to as black cumin seeds. Okay. So you absolutely could use those too. Why not? I think, I think I did the onion powder. So now I'm doing the garlic powder. And if you wanted to sprinkle on a little extra oregano, you can go nuts. Like you can't go wrong with any spice. I'm going to throw on some nigella seeds on one of them just for fun. Okay. So hopefully you've got your uh, matzah spiced up. And by the way, if you want like a variation, we didn't even talk about za'atar yet. There's so much to say. Okay, we're gonna put that in the oven and then I'll come back to this for a minute. In the oven for five minutes, I'm gonna set a timer. Alexa, set matzah timer for five minutes. All right, so just to review what we've got going, we have matzah in the oven for five minutes. We have our onions sauteing low and slow. And just so you can see how mine are looking, which are fabulous. This is, they're starting to get brown. And I have my quinoa cooking 
and I have about three and a half minutes left on the quinoa. So we are all good. Let's take a moment and just talk about za'atar for a second, and then we're going to talk Passover. So za'atar, as I mentioned, are these key ingredients. And you may be wondering if it's hyssop, this light color, and it's turned dark, why is that? There's such a discrepancy between those. Well, this za'atar is considered a Lebanese za'atar. There's different variations, right? Every community has their own go-to version. So this has olive oil in it that gives it that darker green look. There are some za'atars that look more like the hyssopy color. And in fact, one of them is Druze, the Druze community. Um, if you've ever had the pleasure of being on a JNF mission and getting JNF hospitality in a Druze home, um, they will serve za'atar on flatbread and it'll look more like this color because they don't add oil to it. If you were to go to Yemen and have their za'atar, it would be spicy. Syria has some um, garlic flavors to it. So every region has their own go-to flavors. Um, and so I tell you that because guess what? You could make your own za'atar version if you wanted to, right? You could, if you wanna make your own Passover version without the sesame seeds, get some oregano, if you can find some hyssop, some sumac, you could add some garlic to it and mix it in with some olive oil and you're good to go. Okay, speaking of Passover, it's our second year of dealing with COVID and Passover and Hopefully we've got some lessons learned from that and what we can do this year to make our Passover special and meaningful, even if we can't be together as a family um, in the same room, we may still be having to have to do it over Zoom. And so I just wanted to give you a couple of suggestions of ideas that I've come up with to make our Passover a little more meaningful. And uh, so one of them is, Zoom has these great features of being able to ask questions and do polls. Passover is all about asking questions. Why not come up in advance with some questions? It could be about Passover. Maybe you want to ask questions for the younger generations to learn about the family, right? It's door la door. It's one generation to the next. So you could do some polling questions about the family history as well. Um, also with Zoom, we have breakout rooms. You can create breakout rooms. The kids may want to have their own family time in their own breakout room. Mm, P.S. I can smell my matzah cooking. So take a look at yours and make sure it's doing okay because I can smell it in the oven. Okay. Ah, that smells so good. All right. Uh, breakout rooms, you can put the kids into the breakout rooms. And that way they feel like they have their own space to be able to chat. The adults can be in their room. It's kind of like as soon as the kids are done with the chicken soup and matzo balls, what's the first question? Can I be excused from the table? Because they all want to go off and play. So this is another variation of it. We're adapting. We're pivoting. It's COVID still. We got to learn those tools. Um, and the other thing is you can come up with some meaningful discussion questions. And uh, I, I will share this one story. My mom was at the Passover, of course, with us every year. And uh, we decided to put the wicked child, oh, timer, pause. Waiting to see which timer it is. It's for the quinoa. Go ahead and turn your, Alexa, stop timer. Go ahead and turn the stove off for your quinoa. Okay, turn it off, just leave it there. We're gonna let it sit for an additional 12 minutes. So I'm gonna say, Alexa, set quinoa timer for 12 minutes. There we go. Okay, so, so with that, the other timer is about to go off for the matzah. So we're gonna go ahead and take that out so you can take a peek at it and see what it looks like. Take a look at your matzah, turn off your stove to the quinoa, let it sit for 12 minutes. Alexa, stop timer. Oh, this looks good. Okay, people, are you ready? Thank you. The cameraman also acts as the person who removes things from the oven because it's on that side of the kitchen. Hang on one second. Oh, this looks good. We're gonna let that sit for a few minutes. 
Yum. Okay. While you take a peek at that, I just want to finish telling you my discussion question idea. And oh, before I do that, turn your oven to 350 because we're going to preheat for the salmon. Okay. Matzah crackers are out of the oven. The oven should be at 350. Okay, finishing up my little story about a discussion we did a couple years ago. Our kids were much younger, and we decided that we were going to put the wicked child on trial. And what did that mean? One of our kids was the prosecution lawyer, and one of the kids was the defense lawyer, the attorney, right? Pro bono. <laughs> And they each had to come up with reasons why they thought the wicked child was guilty or innocent. And we had a whole discussion at our table about based on the presentations that the kids did and the um, guests were the jury. Okay, so that's just like one idea of something you can do. And you absolutely could do that over Zoom. You could do breakout rooms. Um, and in case you're wondering, we had a hung jury at our table. We couldn't decide because the kids did such a good job at making arguments for, for, and against. One idea, have fun with it. Okay. The spiced matzo crackers are out of the oven. You have reset your oven for 350 so we can make our salmon. Our onions are cooking down. The quinoa is off. It's just resting for the next few minutes. And I am going to pause for a moment because I wanna take a moment to introduce to you my friend who is um, going to share a few words with us. She sits on the Northeast Task Force with me. And not only that, she is a member of the Sapphire and President Society. Please join me in welcoming Marissa Weingarten. Thank you so much, Debbie. Like many of you, I learned every day that Jewish National Fund USA does so much more than planting trees. I first learned that about the Galilee Culinary Institute at an amazing event right here in Los Angeles where I became a Sapphire Society member. JNF USA is developing a nation and is involved in so many areas. It's a little bit of the shtick, the JUF stuff. Community building, forestry, disabilities, education, research and development, heritage site, water solution, and more. We're building playgrounds medical centers, helping solve the water crisis, bringing art, music, culture, and employment to the north and south of Israel and beyond. We are creating a vibrant and modern society. And how excited we are building a culinary institute. Here is a short video. I'm super excited to be sharing with you our upcoming Culinary Academy that will open in Fall 19. It is a, a partnership with the Jewish National Fund and myself in creating a, a unique international culinary center in the Upper Galilee in Israel. Jewish National Fund is opening in the Kiryat Shimona area. The Jewish National Fund International Culinary Institute of Arts, not a cooking school, a full-blown culinary arts school where you will learn everything about culinary arts, from the front of the house to the back of the house, from food security to food technology, from inventory to bookkeeping and accounting and running your own restaurant. Our students will be trained by top professionals and celebrity chefs that will be coming. And we will turn the Upper Eastern Galileo to the culinary capital of the world. Stay tuned. It is an incredible 
As foodie myself, I can't wait to visit. What I love is that we bring life to the frontiers of Israel. And it's this organization that has the vision, not only put Israel on the food map, but also be the food capital of the world. Our goal is attract 300,000 new residents to move to the north. In addition to the Culinary Institute, we are also building a food technology center, a medical center, and just opened the Louder Employment Center in Akko. As we saw in the video, the Culinary Institute is directed by the amazing chef and spice master, Lior Lev Sarkas, who I was lucky to meet. And through food, agriculture, employment, education, and tourism, we will bring life to the North. Prepare yourself for some extraordinary culinary delights. There's going to be a first class restaurant and you're all invited. I can't wait for all of us to visit. Put on aprons and take a cooking class just as we're doing it here today. We are asking you to join our Women for Israel family. Please find a place in your heart by making a meaningful gift to the Galilee Culinary Institute. For those of you that have made a generous gift, we thank you. For a minimum donation of 350, you will join our Women Alliance. For a minimum annual donation of 1800, you will be a proud high society member. Or join me as a Sapphire Society member for an annual minimum donation of 5,000. Please know that every dollar and every dollar counts. We investing out your money wisely together we will make a huge impact. You are about to receive a text, an email. Please click to donate, or there's a link on the chat that you can click on also. Thank you, happy and healthy Passover. And now we are all hungry. So I hand the mic back to you, Debbie. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you for that compelling call to action to become a WFI member. I am so proud to say that I am literally helping building the Israel, the northern part of Israel. You can do it too. You can be a part of it. If you're interested in the task force, Cheryl Buckholtz, I know is here on this call and we'll put out her email if you want to learn more about it. Join me, join us for the strategic growth. Do you know what it means to say that we're going to grow the northern region 300,000 people? It's, it's insane. Only JNF can make that happen. Come be a part of it. Okay, let's get back to cooking. We are going to make our salmon. So go ahead and get your salmon out. We are going to be adding one to two tablespoons. I have a little less than a pound of a half of salmon. And I'm going to go ahead and sprinkle this on, and then I'm just going to pat it in. You may be wondering if you can soak this in advance. You absolutely can if you want to. Totally up to you. But you're going to see right here that I am just going to make it just like this. It doesn't need to marinate. You can if you want to. I'm going to add two tablespoons of olive oil and just drizzle this right on top. And that is going to be delicious. So we're going to get a nice little crust. There we go, right in front of my little blue box. And just zhuzh that around a little. And I'm going to take some lemon slices and just go ahead and lay these on top. When it comes out of the oven, we will uh, give a nice fresh squeeze of lemon. So this is ready to go. We have preheated our ovens at 350. We're going to put this in. If you want to add a little salt, you can because my shawarma spice is salt free. Okay, so a little bit of salt if you would like. You can keep it salt free if you want. Into the oven it goes. Um, we are going to set a timer for 12 minutes. But 
I will tell you, um, I mentioned earlier, we have a probe, a thermometer that you can use. So it's got this little measuring component. And we actually have another one that magnet to the oven and it goes straight into the fish. And that way we will know when it's done. So if you don't have one of these, set a timer for about 12, 15 minutes, depending on the thickness of your fish. And um, you can go the old fashioned way and just kind of cut it open and see if it's flaky, if it's still pink on the inside, maybe it needs a little bit more time, okay? Keep an eye on your onions. Mine look really good. I'm gonna show them to you. They're, you could turn up the heat at this point if you wanted to, to get a nice little caramelization. One of my favorite things to do is actually to add wine to um, onions as they're sauteing and get a really high temperature and get them super brown and then add some wine to it. And oh, that's so good. We're not doing that today. That's just an idea for the future. But here's what we are gonna do that I wanted to share with you. This is the bonus round. This is for people who showed up today. Not only did you register, but you came to the party. And so for that, I wanna say thank you. And this is a recipe I'm gonna show you super quick what you need to do. It's a, oh, quinoa timer is done. Alexa, stop timer. Okay, the quinoa is done. It can sit there for a minute. As soon as I'm done with this, we're gonna zhuzh up our quinoa. Okay. This is just for you guys. It's not out there in the universe. I am going to be taking one cup of yogurt. I'm using a labne, which is a kefir yogurt. It's fermented, but you could use plain yogurt. You could use Greek yogurt, a half of a cucumber. I shredded, shred, 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 shred. I'm holding this down to the camera because I love showing this. I married into this grater, people. This grater is over 28 years old. It's older than 20, oops, cucumber fell on the floor. Uh, older than that, and I just keep it. It doesn't work very well, <laughs> but it's so sentimental, I can't get rid of it, okay? So I did manage to grade with it, honest. I took a half a cucumber, grated it, and now I'm gonna add a tablespoon of shawarma spice to this and mix it up. And guess what? I'm going to use this as a dip for the salmon. Okay? Daddy, if someone doesn't have the shawarma spice, is there an alternative? You, well, it depends what you put on top of your salmon. So whatever spices you've put on top of your salmon, I would honestly put in here. If it's za'atar, it'll work. Um, it, you could do tzatziki dip mix. You could just do some garlic powder, onion powder, paprika. That'll work. Okay. So we're just, or you could, I'm trying to think, what else? Yeah. Those would be some suggestions. So here it is. That is my little bonus recipe because you showed up today. And I'm going to go ahead and put it in my cute little pomegranate dish, right? So we like to keep all of our symbols in there. So this will look super pretty. And what's nice about the cucumbers is it's fresh. It brings a freshness to the dish with the salmon and the shawarma spice, okay? Of course, if you're gonna be serving this at a meat meal and you keep kosher, this, don't do this. <laughs> okay, I keep kosher. I'm not, this is a lunchtime meal for me, honestly. This is a hog daytime meal or during cholomoed, right? After I'm a little burnt out on the brisket and I'm a little burnt out on the chicken, this is a nice refreshing dish for like day four or five. Okay. On to our haroset. We're gonna be making haroset people because you know, you gotta have haroset, whether you're Sephardic or Ashkenazi, it don't matter. We still gotta have haroset on our Seder plate. So with that, we are going to get our raisins, uh, not those raisins, oh, sorry. These raisins, not those dates. Okay, we have dates and raisins in two different recipes, just keeping it straight. So earlier on, you all watched me mince up my dates and watch my blade reject it, but I did manage to uh, get these all chopped up. I am going to go ahead and add a half a cup of raisins. 
right in here. I am going to add a half a cup of almonds slivered. If you don't have slivered, you can just chop up some almonds. If you're allergic to almonds, you could do pistachios. That would be delicious in this. Of course, you could do walnuts or sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, if you have a nut allergy, okay? We are going to add the secret ingredient to my Sephardic Karo set, which is ginger. It gives it a little bit of a spice, a little bit of a kick. It balances out all the sweetness that is happening here, not to mention the sweet wine and the honey. And uh, so Sephardic, let's take a moment as we're doing this. I'm also, so we're gonna add a half a teaspoon of the ginger and a whole teaspoon of cinnamon. Um, so, you know, everybody has haroset on their Seder plate. It's one of the main ingredients. Why is it that Ashkenazi have one version, Sephardic have another? It's using the native plants and, you know, ingredients that grow around you. Not everybody has access to date palm trees, let's say in Poland or Russia, right? It doesn't grow there. So, you know, we still have the same ingredients, but let's be honest, the Sephardic have some really good recipes. So we're taking it. We are gonna add a eighth of a cup of sweet red wine. And I am using Manischewitz Concord grape. And we are gonna add a quarter cup Sorry, I think I got that backwards. Let me re rewind. <laughs> Quarter cup of wine, eighth of a cup of honey. Okay, right? So I'll add a little bit more. Oh, super strength to get open the honey because it's kind of stuck. So just an eighth of a cup, which is like three tablespoons, if you're wondering. It's about. I'll add a little more. What's nice about the wine is this you can make in advance and it just gets better and better. Now you're going to take out your muscles and you're going to just mix all of this together until everything is incorporated. Move that out of the way so you can see what I'm doing. Okay, so we're just going to mix this up. Any liquid from the honey or the wine will eventually get absorbed up into this. Okay, so there we go. And this is it. You're done. This is a really easy. I usually make this the day before, because it's something that can sit, right? Haroset, which is Ashkenazi with the apples and walnuts, I will make the morning of because the apples will get mushy. So I tend to do this one beforehand because you can, it will hold up to it. Now we can go ahead and add this here and we are going to combine our quinoa after this because our quinoa is done. So we've got our haroset, we've got our spiced matzo crackers, our salmon is in the oven. Does it feel like Pesach yet? Sure does. Okay, into the sink that goes. Close this up, must have tidy workspace. They definitely teach that in culinary school 101, must have clean workspace. Okay, quinoa time. Grab your quinoa. Oh, it looks so pretty. It's got that bright yellow color. Going to grab a bowl. Another bowl here. Going to take my quinoa and go ahead and pour that in. Perfect, super fluffy, love it. Okay, smells good, you can smell that shawarma. Now I'm gonna turn off the stove for my onions that I was working so hard to get nicely cooked, slight caramelization. It could have gone longer, but we don't have time today. <laughs> Next time. Okay, get those in. And uh, what this is doing is I cooked it in that two tablespoons of olive oil. So now I'm gonna add the olive oil to this to give it some nice moisture. Mix that up. And we are gonna add the other dates, raisins and parsley along with our toasted almonds. So, you know, you can use the same ingredients in different dishes in the same meal and it helps bring everything together. Okay, so no problem here. Gonna go ahead and add my almonds. I used medjool dates. We didn't even talk, what's the difference between medjool and Douglet dates? Here they are. 
just so you can see one's bigger one's smaller. Medjool dates have a nice caramel flavor to them right we talked about it with olives grapes apples there's different varieties at the end of the day an apple is an apple whether it's a red delicious or a granny smith or a honey crisp at the end of the day they all taste like an apple but there's different nuances right tart sweet whatnot the same is true for dates the medjool dates have more of a caramel flavor sweeter and the deglet dates are a little milder in flavor okay but still the date so for the haroset, I use the deglet because there's enough sweet going on there. So I toned it down. And for the quinoa, I use the medjool. You could use either one. It's the same. All right. Just to Debbie, give you some ideas. Yeah. Debbie, two quick questions about the haroset. Um, one, can it be, can, can we freeze it? Ooh. And two, yeah. um, from someone else, can you use something other than sweet red wine in the haroset? Uh, yeah, great. So I've never frozen the haroset, but I don't see why you couldn't. So I'm gonna go with yes, absolutely. And in terms of sweet red wine, if you don't wanna use an alcohol, you could use grape juice and that's totally fine. If you don't, yeah, you, oh, if you want, don't wanna use sweet red wine and just use wine, yeah, you could do that. It, you lose a little something with it. I mean, there's no reason why you could it. It's going to taste a little different and maybe a little less wine. And don't eat too much. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm adding my parsley. I added my raisins, my almonds, my dates. So there we go. Going to go ahead and add the rest of that in there. So I used flat Italian leaf for this. Of course, you could do curly if you wanted to, whatever you've got. And now I'm going to add it to my pretty dish for serving because it's as if we're getting ready, right? We always eat with our eyes, so we want to serve in nice dishes. And um, you could add salt to this if you want to. There's no salt. So in this, depending on what, how you do your sodium, you absolutely could. And we are starting to pull together everything. So with that, I'm going to move this a little bit out of the way over here. And our salmon is getting there, not quite yet. Um, we can take a look at it. Here we go. So we're going to go ahead and bring this over. And we are going to start to build our salad. The, the arugula is going to go on. Um, take a look at your salmon and uh, see how it's looking. We're going to go ahead and open up the oven so I can see mine. It's coming along. I might crank up my temperature a little bit higher. So that way it keeps going. We don't run out of time. So the last thing I have here is the salad that we're going to place everything on. I have my lemons. And I have my one of my favorite Israeli dishes. I'll just show you this real quick. Ta da! Okay. Uh, it's got beautiful pomegranates in there. Okay, so we are going to prep our salad. You'll see, I mentioned earlier, I like to cook with paper towels and doing my food prep. It helps absorb the moisture so that if I make something in advance, it's not going to be all dripping, sopping wet in my hand. So I do do that. And I have my tomatoes on this side and this is what I'm going to put the salmon on as I mentioned this is something that I might serve as a lunch and if you would like to dress this up you absolutely can if you wanted to add a little bit of olive oil and lemon juice you could add some salt here also and so you just have a really soft vinaigrette on this okay so you can keep that in mind and Debbie, if someone finds arugula too bitter, do you have a suggestion for a great, substitute? Great question. Yes, arugula has bitter. It has peppery notes to it. So if you find that that is too strong with you, you could do kale, you could do spinach. Um, I, I like to use heartier leaves because we're going to be putting salmon on it. If you're serving the salmon cold, you know, maybe you're not serving it hot. Um, you could do uh, Boston lettuce, 
baby butter, lettuce, anything that your palate, the only thing I wouldn't do is iceberg. <laughs> Maybe I'm a lettuce snob. I don't know. It's not meant for a salad like this. This is too elegant. Iceberg is meant for like, you know, fish tacos or something like that. Okay. <laughs> Street food. Uh, okay. A couple more ideas I wanted to share with you about Passover before our time is up. Other things you can do in your Seder to make it meaningful. We have four cups of wine, people. There's no reason why you have to try the same wine over and over and over again. Why not do a wine tasting and try four different types of wine? And if I may, maybe you want to go to the Mitzvah Marketplace, which is JNF's website for online shopping, and you can get two fabulous Israeli wines that work with JNF, Stern Winery and Kishore. Kishore is really special, of course, because they work with special needs who help make the wine, right? Part of our programs through JNF. Check out the Mitzvah Marketplace. You might even find some great Afi Coleman prizes. What a wonderful idea if you can't be together with your family and you want to send them an Afi Coleman prize. I'm going to show you what I got for real from Adi Negev, which is also on the Mitzvah Marketplace. No joke. Look at this beautiful pomegranate. Okay, I bought a ton of these. I couldn't help myself. And it comes with a little card that explains Adi Negev and how this was made by somebody with special needs. Okay, so here's one idea for Afi Komen. What a nice way to send a gift. And this is one that has the blessing for the home. Just a thought, okay? Afi Komen from a distance if we can't be together. Okay, the next thing I wanna share with you is However you are doing your Seder, you still need a Haggadah, right? Haggadah is essential. So picking the right one makes all the difference. This is the one that we like to use. It's called A Different Night. Um, it's published in Israel. I'm sure you can find it online. Um, and what I love about it is, look how thick it is. It doesn't mean you have to go through the whole book each Seder. It means you can pick and choose and make your Seders different, not only each night, but each year. There's wonderful discussion questions in here and um, some great songs. And to that point, sometimes you have people at your Seder. Oh, I don't have that sheet there. Sometimes you have people at your Seder who, oh, my husband took it. He's going and getting it. No wonder, what's that? I used it for my class. Oh, he used it for his class. My husband's a rabbi, go figure. He had a class, he was teaching Passover and he took mine. <laughs> nice going. Okay, songs you won't find in the Seder. So, you know, not everybody reads Hebrew. Not everybody knows Avadim Hayinu or Dayenu or Chagad Yah or Miodea, but you want people to be able to participate. And creating a separate songbook is a really fun way to do that. You can, you can go online, find songs to tunes that everybody knows, such as Take Me Out to the Seder, Take Me Out to the Ball Game. These are a few of my favorite things, Sound of Music, and so on, okay? There's all kinds of show tunes that have been transferred into this that everybody knows. There's no business like show business, there, there's, no I, like there's no Seder like our Seder, okay? Oh, and Afi coming around the mountain when she comes and don't sit on the Afi come into the tune of glory, glory, hallelujah. These are songs we really sing. That is my personal favorite, don't sit on the Afi come in. Okay, so I'm just saying it's a great way for people who may not be as familiar with all this, maybe this seems intimidating, you can do this too, and everybody can participate. I know we're on Zoom. Unmute everyone. Let it be chaos and have everybody singing together so you can feel like you are together. Um, so just a couple other words about Haggadot. Can you tell I'm an educator? I really am. Okay, teaching 25 years, you keep a collection. Speaking of which, all of this is my Passover shtick for teaching. None of this is what I use for Passover in case you're wondering, oh my God, she draped it up. No, no, no. It's in a container that I keep. We are um, nearing 1130, but I just wanted to show you some other ones. We're going to go ahead and pull our salmon out of the oven. 
So that way you can see it. Take a peek at yours. Maybe it's still cooking and it needs a few more minutes, but I am going to start to bring everything together. So we've got our spiced matzo crackers here. Oh, the salmon looks delicious. So good. And we're going to pair that in there. Going to grab a spatula. We're, we're zooming in on the salmon. And then I'm going to ever so elegantly squeeze some lemon juice on top. Oh, do you hear the sizzle? That sounds good. I know it's hot, but I need to give you the image of what it's going to look like for the complete meal. So I'm carefully transferring that over. Oh, it made it all in one piece. There we go, mostly, minus that little end. Oh, mm, so good, yum. All right, my friends, I want to thank you so much for joining me. Joining us, our JNF family, spicing it up for Passover, coming up with some great ideas, recipes, things for the Seder. I wish you all a wonderful Chag Sameach. And now it is my pleasure to welcome Sapphire Society member, Carol Sokol. Thank you, Debbie. What an incredible menu. I'm excited to cook your delicious meal for my Seder. I'm so happy to have joined these wonderful women that I'm meeting through this great organization. And let me share some upcoming events because this is how we cultivate our friendships and stay connected. Information will be posted in the chat. It will also be sent out in our follow-up email. A week from today on March 24th at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, we have an event with Deputy Mayor of Foreign Relations, Economic Development Tourism for the Jerusalem Municipal Council called Women Transforming Government. On Tuesday, April 6th at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, we're hosting a thank you event for the Sapphire Society members with Captain Libby Weiss, former IDF spokesman, spokesperson who's an expert on Israel's fight for international legitimacy and the challenges of fighting terror under a global spotlight. But last but certainly not least, um, I know many of you will be so excited for our annual Women for Israel event, May 10th with Michael Aloni. You know, the Israeli actor who plays, plays Akiva on Stitzel. And because May is Women's Month, all donations during the month of May will be matched up to a million dollars. We hope you'll join us. Thank you so much. We sincerely look forward to seeing you up close and personal and hugging you. Know that you're us so valued. Have a happy, healthy, and meaningful Pesach and Toda Rabah. And? I'm 
Yeah. 